This video is showing an old man at a street stall finishing up food left by others. The person filming asked him what troubles he's facing. The old man shared that he's gotten older and had lost the money he made from selling scrap at the market. When asked about his family, he mentioned he has three sons and a daughter, all working away from home and none could make it back for the new year. The person filming asked if the money his kids sent should be enough for him, but the old man just waved it off, saying his kids have their own children to look after and can't really take care of him. On February 28th, near the Tianhui department store in Guangzhou's Panyu district, there was this elderly person protesting to get his pension back. Then there's this village grandma without a pension, forced to sell socks on the street to get by. And believe it or not, she was robbed by the urban management officers. So much for the harmonious society the government talks about, right? And here's a kicker. Lately, there's been a trending topic about Chinese people who are born after the 90s needing to retire in their late 70s or 80s. Can you believe that? James Liang, a demographer, in an interview with China Times, highlighted the unsustainable nature of the current retirement system. He pointed out that individuals in their 50s and 60s are retiring with decent pensions, a system that cannot persist due to the diminishing younger population. The future, he suggests, may involve either a reduction in pension amounts or an increase in the retirement age to between 70 and 80 to address this imbalance. China's current retirement age is set at 60 for men, 55 for female officials, and 50 for female workers. Recent years have seen proposals for extending these ages, met with widespread skepticism and criticism. As the two sessions approach in 2024, there is speculation that a policy to delay retirement might be announced. With a report from China Business Journal citing the China Pension Report 2023, suggesting that the retirement age could be adjusted to 65. According to official explanations, over the past 30 years, China's population structure has shifted from a pyramid shape to more of a spindle shape. The Ministry of Civil Affairs and the China National Committee on Aging in their 2022 National Aging Development Communique indicated that by the end of 2022, China had 280 million people aged 60 and above and 209.7 million people aged 65 and above, accounting for 14.9% of the total population. The dependency ratio for the elderly population has reached 21.8%, marking an increase of 9.1% since 2012 and indicating a continued upward trend. The elderly dependence ratio, which measures the number of elderly people relative to the working age population, is used to indicate how many elderly individuals are supported by every 100 working age people. The Chinese Communist Party, CCP, views the postponement of retirement as a necessary response to the aging population, the financial risks to the social security system, and the maintenance of intergenerational equity. Delaying retirement would reduce the number of years workers receive pensions, thereby lessening the fund's expenditures. However, this official stance has failed to convince the public, with many questioning the rationale behind continuing to contribute to the pension system. Critics argue that it might be more beneficial to invest or manage their finances independently rather than relying on a system that seems to be failing to meet their future needs. Some people say, quote, it seems unnecessary to pay for pension insurance. It's uncertain if we can live past 70. Many young people already have a lot of white hair and some might not even have the money to seek medical treatment when they get old. By the close of 2023, the total assets of China's pension fund reached 15 trillion yuan, making up 12% of its GDP. This figure stands considerably below the average pension fund size, which is approximately 80% of GDP in countries that are members of the OECD. Since 2012, the number of insured individuals has been decreasing, while the number of retirees continues to rise. Without intervention, China's pension fund could face a shortfall of nearly 10 trillion yuan within a decade.
The issue is compounded by widespread employment anxiety among people as young as 35 and the phenomenon of, quote, lying flat or disengagement from the workforce among those unable to find stable employment. This raises the question of who will be willing or able to work until the age of 65 or even into their 70s and 80s. Business professor Xie Tian from the University of South Carolina Icon has pointed out the severe challenges facing China's pension system. He notes that fiscal difficulties have exacerbated the risk of insolvency for the pension system, with data from China's Ministry of Finance revealing pension budget deficits in 11 provinces as of 2023. A 2022 research report predicted that China's pension shortfall could expand to 10 trillion yuan within the next 5 to 10 years. The University of Chinese Academy of Social Sciences estimates that by 2028, pension expenditures will exceed income. Professor Xie believes that China's pension fund could face insolvency sooner than expected, a situation exacerbated by the economic downturn and young people's choice to lie flat. Consequently, the government's proposal to extend the retirement age is likely to be met with widespread dissatisfaction. Many people who had planned to retire in their 50s or 60s now face the prospect of delaying retirement by 5 to 10 years, compounded by the threat of unemployment, therefore creating significant hardship. After lifting strict pandemic lockdown measures, China's economy has struggled to recover. The real estate market remains weak, foreign capital is flowing out, government debt is rising, and youth unemployment remains high. A significant portion of young and middle-aged employees are facing layoffs, pushing many into what is referred to as the, quote, 45-degree life. This concept captures a state of limbo between apathy and ambition in their approach to life. Professor Xie also noted that in early 2022, the CCP proposed a gradual approach to delaying retirement, adjusting the retirement age by a few months every year or few years, with the aim of eventually reaching the desired retirement age. Critics argued that the retirement policy formulated by the CCP is unfair, contrasting sharply with the United States, where everyone, regardless of professions and economic status, is covered by social security. In China, however, the benefits primarily extend to certain urban residents, enterprise employees, or government officials, leaving a significant portion of the population, especially farmers, with minimal support. Wang Fengqin, a retired worker living in a village in Heilongjiang province, exemplifies the struggles faced by many. The 70-year-old told Reuters that her monthly pension is barely enough to afford anything beyond the essentials. She currently has worsening stomach pains. However, the cost of a hospital visit, which could run up to 1,000 yuan, is beyond her financial reach. An investigation by Reuters involving interviews with residents of Heilongjiang province revealed that many elderly individuals struggle to afford basic necessities. In 2022, the pension for individuals over 60 in Heilongjiang was 134 yuan per month, with the amount varying based on individual contribution levels and the duration of contributions. In some rural areas, pensions can be as low as 100 yuan per month. Due to financial hardship, Wang Chanling, 71, continues to farm and take on odd jobs, such as repairing potholes. He stated that his body can no longer withstand the physical toll, yet he needs to sustain his livelihood. During the cold winter months, he relies on burning corn stalks to heat his home. Addressing the issue of delayed retirement, Li Yuanhua, a historian residing in Australia, pointed out that the CCP's move to significantly raise the retirement age is a response to a shortage in pension funds. He explained that contributions made during employment intended for pension funds especially go to the state, with pensions provided by social or national funds, not by employers. By requiring individuals to continue working, the government effectively postpones pension payouts, shifting the burden to enterprises that continue to contribute to the pension fund without dispersing benefits to retirees. This suggests that previous pension funds may have been misappropriated, leaving the government unable to make payments and thus eager to implement this policy. 
Data from China's Ministry of Finance shows that 11 out of 31 provincial-level jurisdictions in China face pension budget deficits, with Heilongjiang province experiencing one of the most severe shortfalls. Projections by the Chinese Academy of Sciences indicate that by 2035 the pension system will deplete its reserves. The Heilongjiang provincial government relies on financial transfers from wealthier regions to pay minimal benefits to individuals like Wang Fengqin. China's pension system, managed at the provincial level and operating on a pay-as-you-go basis, sees contributors from the current workforce used to pay retirees' pensions. In 2018, the Chinese government established a special fund to transfer pension funds from wealthier provinces like Guangdong to deficit-stricken regions, a measure economists view as a temporary fix. The household registration system, Hukou, also contributes to the fragmentation of China's pension system. Millions of Chinese workers migrate for work but are only eligible for social services in their place of origin. Due to lower standards of education and health care in these areas, migrant workers are reluctant to contribute to social security. Many employers also fail to provide pensions and other benefits for these workers as they are often employed under temporary or informal contracts. Professor Xie Tian highlights significant flaws and deceptive practices within China's pension system, noting its inefficient operation and frequent misappropriation of funds. Coupled with China's declining birth rate, a decrease in the population, and a general trend among the youth towards opting out of marriage and childbearing, with many choosing to lie flat and withdraw from the social security system, these factors have led to the premature depletion of retirement funds. The CCP has found itself unable to cope with these challenges, prompting the introduction of policies to delay retirement. Since 2023, an increasing number of young people have chosen to stop contributing to Social Security or even to withdraw from the system altogether. Many express dissatisfaction with current social welfare and labor rights, adopting a pessimistic view of the future and considering retirement an unattainable goal. They said, quote, we're struggling to afford even basic necessities, so who is Social Security even benefiting? And, quote, the main reason for stopping Social Security contributions is the lack of money, followed by the delay in retirement age. Just as we approach retirement, it gets pushed further away, making it impossible to receive any benefits. In August of the previous year, state media reported that recently, 38 million people had suspended their pension contributions, with another 43 million opting out entirely. Li Yuanhua further points out that the difficulty for young people to find jobs is exacerbated by the elderly not retiring, which also hampers the career advancement opportunities for the younger generation. Some officials continue working past the age of 60, further affecting young people's promotion prospects. A man interviewed expressed his frustration. I recently interviewed for a job paying 5,000 yuan, and as soon as they found out I was born in 1983, I was immediately rejected. Half a year ago, I was earning 30,000 yuan a month, and now I can't even find a job paying 5,000 yuan. I just turned 40 this year, and I'm truly at a loss about what to do next. Entrepreneur Mr. Huang commented that his company is not considering applicants over 50 years old. If you're unlucky to be unemployed at 40, you're on your own for the long 25 years until retirement. The delay in retirement simply means that regardless of whether you've contributed to the pension fund for 15 or 25 years, you have to wait until 65 to access it. You have to live to 90 to recoup the pension contributions you've made. Moreover, state-owned enterprises have sustained a group of corrupt officials and officers who continue to enjoy privileges. Mr. Huang questions why the hard-working and diligent lower classes in China end up living in such difficult circumstances, seemingly trapped in a cycle of exploitation. If you live to 80, you'll only receive 15 years of pension. Considering the average lifespan in China might not even reach 80, delaying retirement is a huge trap. However, this policy doesn't affect government officials. They don't rely on salaries for their livelihoods, having many other questionable sources of income. They're indifferent to this wage issue. 
For them, working until 65 might be necessary. They don't face the concept of unemployment as long as they don't make mistakes, get fired or resign, which makes them unaffected by these changes. Comparatively, the compensation of retired CCP Central High officials is startling. Beijing Spring reports that 12 retired officials and the level of the CCP's Central Politburo Standing Committee, the Chairman of the National People's Congress, the Vice President of the State, and the Deputy Director of the Central Advisory Committee, enjoy the benefits of expensing government fund of 326 million yuan, averaging 27.3 million yuan per person. Additionally, 105 retired senior officials, including members of the CCP Politburo, vice chairpersons of the National People's Congress, vice premiers, standing committee members of the Central Advisory Committee, and members of the Central Military Commission enjoy, quote, an expense on government fund of 671 million yuan, averaging over 6.3 million yuan per person. Furthermore, 5,537 retired provincial and ministerial level officials, including well-known figures across different industries, incur annual government expenses ranging from 700,000 to over 6 million yuan. The average annual expense for these retired officials in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong, Zhejiang, and Fujian exceeds 5 million yuan per person. On Platform X, netizens claim, quote, these figures are outdated. The current situation is 10 times worse. Whose country is this, if not for the people living on this land? Why does the CCP get to do this? Without the CCP stepping down, this situation will never change. Analyses suggest that the CCP's one-child policy contributed to the population decline and aging, further intensifying the pressure on the pension budget. However, when the CCP realized the severity of the issue and encouraged higher birth rates, it was too late. Many Chinese now fear having children, citing the high cost of upbringing. As highlighted in the video, an increasing number of individuals are hesitant to have children, largely due to the overwhelming responsibilities associated with raising them. Unlike the past, where child-rearing was more about providing basic needs, modern parenting involves a more hands-on approach that many find exhausting. The demands of modern parenting, including daily school runs, homework supervision, extracurricular activities, and organizing weekend engagements, significantly add to the burden of parents. A man also shared his reluctance to have children, believing that without them, his vulnerabilities in life would decrease and the stresses of life would significantly lessen. He expressed unwillingness to subject his life to the pressures of 996 work schedule, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, questioning the value of such a sacrifice. Additionally, he voiced concerns about the potential for unemployment at the age of 35, which would make supporting a child challenging. Analysts note that an increase in the birth rate would increase more young workers into the labor market, potentially easing the burden on the pension system. While not a fundamental solution, it's clear that delaying retirement could significantly deter people from wanting to have children. If working-age couples need to work longer to accrue sufficient retirement savings, they might postpone having children or decide against it altogether. Furthermore, delaying retirement could increase economic pressures on families, influencing decisions around childbearing. Wang Fengqin, an elderly individual mentioned earlier, has two sons living in Hegang, Heilongjiang, each earning about 3,000 yuan a month. Her elder son, a 46-year-old truck driver, and her younger son, a 44-year-old firefighter, each have one child. Wang stated her sons are hesitant to have more children due to the high cost of raising them. A report on the cost of raising children in China, released by James Liang's team, shows that the average cost of raising a child from birth to 17 years old is about 1.3 million yuan for high-income families and 667,000 yuan for urban families. In first-year cities like Shanghai, the cost can exceed 1 million yuan. These figures illustrate the growing financial burden of child-rearing on young families. With the median disposable income last year at 47 and 122 yuan, most of the income goes towards child-rearing in the absence of debts like mortgages or car loans. 
This financial strain is compounded when considering the time and effort parents invest in raising their children. In essence, the core issue is the lack of financial resources. High housing prices, educational costs, and unstable work environments and incomes represent widespread challenges faced by the Chinese population. A netizen shared the experience of his friend who is married and runs a seafood business. Because of having a mortgage, he dares not have even one child due to the financial pressures involved. Previously, his business, catering to the general public with affordably priced seafood, was fairly successful. He had hoped to have children, but the increasing difficulties of maintaining his business in recent years has forced him to abandon this thought. Now in his 30s, he feels he is soon to surpass the ideal age for parenthood. It's not that he lacks the desire or responsibility to have children or that he dislikes them, rather he feels overwhelmed by the economic challenges. This issue is compounded for many who face unemployment after 35, some of whom do not have children while others do. This other netizen, who is also a parent, is currently facing challenges and seeks a stable income to provide a healthy upbringing for their child. He also proposes several social policy recommendations, suggesting that businesses be given incentives to pay higher wages and offer more comprehensive benefits, including pensions and health insurance. Additionally, he advocates for reduced housing prices, extended periods of free education, and lower child-rearing costs, such as reducing the price of baby products. He believes these measures could help address the declining birth rate. For China to foster a better environment for progress, Professor Xu Chenggang, a senior research scholar at the Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions, points out that China is grappling with fundamental institutional challenges. Past reforms often involved minor adjustments without altering the core system. However, this approach has reached its limits, necessitating a focus on fundamental institutional issues and deeper reforms. This entails comprehensive political, economic, and social reforms to address current challenges. For example, in the banking sector, a major issue is the monopoly of state-owned banks, which hampers financing for small and mid-sized enterprises SMEs, due to a lack of widespread small and medium banks, making it difficult for private capital to enter the banking sector. This significantly impacts the development of SMEs. Furthermore, the securities market faces foundational issues. Anomalies in China's securities market are partly due to most listed companies being state-owned, with a significant portion of their shares not freely tradable. Thus, governance issues of these listed companies are disconnected from the securities market and the rights of minority shareholders are not adequately protected. Professor Xu also notes that in other countries, financial regulation is government-operated but must be conducted against the backdrop of judicial independence, with independent enforcement agencies overseeing financial regulation. However, in China, the lack of judicial independence impedes the effectiveness of financial regulation. Addressing these fundamental institutional issues is crucial for China's reforms to progress smoothly and achieve substantial results. Without resolving these challenges, reforms cannot advance effectively.